Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It is July 21st, 2024. We're going to go high risk in this video. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. <clears throat> now, first, crypto, I owe my audience this. Years ago, I was an investor in uh, Dash, right? I know people are looking at the top 100 cryptos and Dash isn't even on the page. Well, understand back then, Dash, they were idealistic. They um, came up with a concept, the master node concept. And I researched it and I thought, my goodness, this is a bonanza. So, of course, there was a countdown to the debut of the Dash master node. And when it hit, the market was flat. No one understood the master node concept. It came, it went without a ripple. To make a long story short, the master node is now all over cryptocurrency. Dash, which was flat. Think that movie Seabiscuit, where the horse is running and Jeff Bridges sees the horse and it's losing the race badly and he just looks down. That's where Dash was. Dash rose up, made a lot of people rich, got to over a thousand uh, dollars a uh, digital asset let's just say uh, dash was so far ahead of the curve that if you hung in there you were richly rewarded well right now believe it or not dash is about to top itself and no one seems to be noticing dash is dropping evolution which is gonna make cryptocurrency as easy to use as using PayPal and it's decentralized, right? Dash is digital cash. No one's going to know you're doing the transactions. We'll see how the regulators cope with this, right? But the key is the ease of use. Folks, please Google it. Dash evolution. You might be so far ahead of the crowd that it doesn't make a ripple at least for the first few months, right? The key is to recognize a breakthrough when you see one, eventually the market may come around. Understand, most startups fail, just like most restaurants fail, right? Maybe the market recognizes it, maybe it doesn't. But just understand, you're going to be one lucky son of a gun if you're there when the market recognizes it. Now, the theme of this video is that this is a mispriced summer. There is money just sitting there on the table for anyone to walk in the room and pick up. Right again, remember, life is unfair. Know when people are hopeful instead of realistic. Right? In American politics, and if you disagree with me, tell us about it in the comment section, of this YouTube video. This is an open forum. In American politics, in my opinion, Donald Trump is going to be the next president of the United States. They canceled him. They sued him. We all know he didn't use a condom. Now he's been shot at. And he's still standing. Even in blue states like North Carolina, and New Jersey people are noticing right let me point out that if on election night you notice that Chris Christie state of New Jersey is going for Donald Trump then on election night if you haven't been convinced up until that point you need to hop online and place a bet on it Right? Just understand, Trump is leading in places or is highly competitive in places where he shouldn't be. Understand the way polls work. Let's say I'm hanging out. Let's say I'm a free market, hypothetically. Let's say I'm a free market type. 
right? I'm not even a, mer a mercantilist who is who Donald Trump is. Think William McKinley, right? Instead of Grover Cleveland, who Trump should be uh, following. Well, anyway, let's just say they come over to me and I privately know because of the treatment of um, immigrants and tariffs, uh, you know, the whole debt spending thing. Let's say I know I'm not going to vote. They come over to me, they stick a bike in my face. You know, most of my friends are very blue. You know, they say, hey, who are you voting for? I'll give them a name just to get the interviewer out of my face. But that's not the way the vote's going to turn out. Right? If I'm not going to go vote, then the poll I've just participated in is distorted. Well, understand, things are distorted right now to the point where... You can go to Polymarket and you'll see that in several bets, Donald Trump is underpriced. In my opinion, that's worth a look. Let me just point out too that I communicate several times a week with hardcore, we'll call them Democrats, right? And I listen to the comments. And let's just say, in my opinion, it's clear. Donald Trump is going to be the next president of the United States. Right? That's clear. Um, the Democrats at this stage don't even support Kamala Harris. I believe the Democrats are going to have a somewhat open convention. There'll be a new voice. Right? It'll galvanize the media for about five minutes. Right? But understand, at the end of the day, a lot of people are going to say, well, we have a lot of challenges. We're headed into a recession. In case people don't know, look at the Buffett indicator. Right? We're headed into a recession. China right now arguably is in a depression. Right? Know what's really going on. Right? Germany's having problems. Uh, they've had to cut their aid to Ukraine, which is going to lose. Um, their war with Russia... Just understand the world is bad off right now. Change of leadership in the United Kingdom. And given that reality, at the end of the day, people are going to know who they need to vote for. People are going to say, wow, who's going to have courage under fire? Who do I believe is going to not put the American military at risk? Right? Say what you want. You know, who's tough enough? to be sued while running for president, to be losing lawsuits um, and to still be standing, right? I'm not saying Donald Trump should win. I'm a gambler. I just want to know who's going to win so I can cash. I think people are going to be cashing in on Donald Trump. Let's talk about the Paris Olympics, folks. Basketball is a chemistry sport. Uh, the U.S. men's basketball team is out of sync. A one-point win against South Sudan, where South Sudan scores 100 points. Folks, that's simply ridiculous. Right? That's simply ridiculous. Let me just point out, though, for those of you remembering back to the Dream Team. Right? And when I say the Dream Team, there's only one. Right, Michael, Magic, Larry, Chris Mullen, David, right, Clyde. I mean, there's Malone, Stockton. There's only one Dream Team. Let's not confuse it. There's no Dream Team 2 or Dream Team 3. There's only one Dream Team. But understand, the world has changed. The reigning defensive player of the year is from France. The reigning MVP, NBA MVP, is again foreign-born. Right now, let me just make a point here. Our team right now doesn't seem to realize that it has enough defensive closers on it to stop any team from getting to 100 points. 
right? The team doesn't have an identity. So somehow, and I mean this, somehow we have Anthony Davis on the team, Drew Holiday on the team, Derek White on the team, Bam Adebayo on the team. Folks, these are all defensive stoppers. This isn't a team that should be in track meets where 201 points are scored. No, no, this is a team that should be in games where the other team scores 75 points, 80 points, and we score 90 to 100 and win with a comfortable margin. Right, that's who this team is. So, Steve Kerr is going to have to figure things out. Understand, in the second half of games, you need to see at least three guys who are defensive stoppers on the court. This, and I'm talking about defensive stoppers now, right? LeBron's a great player. LeBron hasn't been first-team all-defense for several years. I'm talking about current defensive stoppers. Joel Embiid, right now, is a defensive stopper, right? He's on the team. So in the second half of games, I don't care what egos are involved. You're going to have to pull some of the offensive guys so we can have defense on the court, right? Defense wins championships. One of the secrets to the Boston Celtics is that they are so good defensively that their backcourt, both of them, are on the U.S. national team. Derek White and Drew Holiday. Right, folks? That's the best defensive backcourt in the National Basketball Association. These guys have rings for a reason. I hope you haven't been looking at the Celtics and thinking it's all about Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, right? So the U.S. has the horses on their Olympic team. They need to reconfigure it to realize this is not the go-go 1992 era. This is a different era. If the U.S. is going to win this, they need to go out and defensively stifle the opposition, right? Right? Before you even hear what the U.S. scored, you knew something was wrong when you heard South Sudan had scored 100 on us. Right? You just hear the South Sudan part of that box score. And you say, oh, gee, we did not play good ball. Right? With this team, opponents like South Sudan, it should be viewed as a loss if South Sudan tops 80 points, folks. Right? So Joel Embiid has it backwards, right? He's talking about old guys on the U.S. team. No, 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 no. Where that South Sudan game was blown was on the lack of defensive focus. Team USA needs to have an identity. It can't be a Jordan, Magic, Larry Bird, Chris Mullen identity, right? With this roster... The identity should be a Detroit Piston identity, right? Isaiah, James Edwards, Lambeer, right? That's that's the identity the team needs. Let's turn to boxing. Brad Paul's delivered for premium subscribers. In the comments section of this YouTube video, tell us the, about the bets you placed on the new British middleweight champion. Now, he beat a better boxer, Nathan Heaney, who had faster hand speed. Because Pauls has the bigger punch, is older, is experienced. Maybe not older than Heaney, but he's in his mid-30s, right? And importantly, Heaney can't control the pacing of fights. In handicapping fights, when you see a guy who's a better athlete, you need to ask a troubling question. Right? Can the guy impose that athleticism on an opponent in both good times and bad times? Right? Haney could never slow down Pauls. It cost him. 
right? He was the champion going into these two fights. First fight ends in a draw. Now Pauls wins the second fight. Of course, betters got great odds on Pauls. So now you have a situation at middleweight. Figure out the situation before you figure out who's going to win an individual fight. Hamza Shiraz, let's be clear here, he is the best middleweight in the United Kingdom. Right, the question is whether Janabek is still a middleweight. Right, Janabek passed on a recent title defense, and understand that's major for boxers because these paydays are really event based. Right, you only have like two, three paydays a year. And to pass on a title defense, that's bad. Understand, too, the sanctioning body has said, hey, player, how could you do this to us? You need to show us your medical records, right? We're hearing Janabek is dehydrated right around the time for a fight. I believe the weight cut probably got the best of him. So the question is whether Janabek can continue on at middleweight. Right now, understand how deep the water is at middleweight in the United Kingdom. As I make this video, Chris Eubank is considering whether to fight Canelo in Las Vegas. Right now, folks, I don't care about the age on the certificate. That's obvious since I back Brad Paul's, right? Age of the birth certificate is not going to phase me that much if you have skills that translate. Chris Eubank has skills that translate. Right, He can fight front foot, he can fight back foot, he can be the lead, he can be the counter. Right, Don't be fooled by the Liam Smith night. Let me just point out too, every boxer has the worst night of their career. Right, That's just the way things operate. There are going to be some nights where you're at your best for whatever reason. There are going to be some nights where it's just not there. Right, Ray Leonard, the great Ray Leonard, talks about how he'd be walking into the ring for a fight. And he'd know that it's just not there. My words, not his. Right? It just wasn't there. For Eubank against Liam Smith. By the way, Eubank starts that fight well. But then lets the fight go. Right? Well, just understand. I view that eubank Canelo fight as a highly competitive fight. Right? Let me also say, too. Canelo's done enough in the sport where, you know, I'm not going to lose sleep over the fact that Canelo is not fighting David Benavides right now. Right? Let me also point out, too, to the Benavides crowd. And I'm a Benavides believer. Right? I, I recognize Benavides is unbeaten as we have this conversation. Right? But I need for people to look closely at that Grovesdick fight. Understand, Grovesdick has been in the ring with heavy punchers before Benavides. Right? Grovesdick beat Adonis Stevenson, for crying out loud. Grosdick gave Arthur Beterbiev one of his best fights. So here's Grosdick in against a guy he sparred against in the past. Benavides. Right, folks? Benavides' last fight. Why are we ignoring it? Benavides goes up to 175. Understand, all eyes should be on 175 because you have Bevel against Benavides this year. Right? You would think... Uh, excuse me, Bevel against Beterbiev this year, right? You would think Benavides, since he fought at 175, you would think Benavides would get that ringside seat. You would think whoever wins that fight, Benavides would say, hey, man, I'm here. Hey, guys, look over here in my section. Give me a piece of this action. I'm unbeaten. I'm worthy. I'm here. I'm ready. Right, you would you would think Benavides would hang around 175. Now, look, we all know that the paydays in fighting Canelo are huge. I would argue that Benavides against either Beterbiev or Bevel would have a few zeros on that paycheck, wouldn't it? Instead, Benavides is still saying, "Hey, no, I haven't left 168. I still want to fight Canelo." Right, Canelo's pivoting. He's saying, look, I want to fight Chris Eubank. Right? Folks, I'm not going to lose that much sleep over it. I think Eubank is a dangerous opponent. 
right? I think Eubank is a much more dangerous opponent than Jaime Munguia, for example, right? So let's see how the whole thing plays out. My point to you is don't be surprised if Eubank, who's already fought at 168 in the past, right? Isn't that where he fought Billy Joe Saunders? Don't be surprised if Eubank doesn't go old school because Eubank's in a fitness. And if Eubank doesn't fight Canelo while he's weighing 163, 164, right? Understand, you don't have to come up all the way to the weight at which you're fighting. Many old timers, Ray Robinson, for example, would show up weighing one or two pounds below the weight limit. Right, Eubank could say, hey, I'm at 160 by choice. I feel good at this weight. I'm not going to add on every pound I can against Canelo. It's more important that I feel comfortable and that I know my body on fight night than it is that I have a few extra pounds. Well, let me just say, if Eubank shocks the world and shocks Canelo, and then if there's a rematch, right, that's the fashion. Canelo has the market power to say, hey, I want a rematch clause put in this. And if Canelo takes the rematch, which he didn't, for Bevo, right? Well, just understand, if Eubank gets by Canelo, right? I'm not necessarily saying it happens. All I'm saying is it can happen. Eubank does know how to use length. He has the length advantage, right? That's the ultimate chess match. Canelo has a back foot, folks, by the way. If Canelo is on his front foot and feels that Eubank isn't biting, that Eubank can operate on his back foot, which he did against uh, Yildirim, for example. Look at that fight. And if Canelo then decides, let me get on my back foot, which is where Canelo was against Danny Jacobs, which is where Canelo was for the first Golovkin fight, right? That Canelo-Eubank fight could be really one of the tech events of the year where you're watching all aspects of the sport. Great defense. Canelo's the better defensive fighter than Eubank. Front foot, back foot, guys playing possum, right? Um, Canelo almost certainly would try to go after Eubank's body. Eubank almost certainly wouldn't want to linger too much in the pocket against Canelo. Eubank does have a jab. He does have a reach advantage, right? My point in all this is just to understand, 160, particularly in the United Kingdom, has gotten very interesting here, right? Janabek, if he can still make weight, right, would be devastating as an opponent. It would be combustible. If he were to fight Shiraz, if he were to fight Canelo, if he, well, hell, he could fight Canelo at 168. Um, if he were to fight Eubank, right? This is one of those spots in boxing that you need to keep an eye on. Let's talk about 175. Now, the answer to the question of who is better from this seat, Christian and Billy, Edgar Belanga, Jaime Munguia. I know I'm mixing in 168 pounders, right? But some of these young guys are going to end up at 175. In my opinion, the answer to that question might be Diego Pacheco. Remember the name, right? Someone has got to bring length to the party. Someone with long power, more ring coverage than some of these hookers, right? I'm guessing Pacheco isn't as well known with the fans. He doesn't have fan backing as the other guys. So here again, I see opportunity. Let's talk heavyweight. Folks, this August card in Southern California is going to be an eye-opener. The mandatory contender, and I believe it's the WBA, is Martin Bacoli. Right now, according to reports, he beat up Usyk in sparring. And it makes sense. Right? Because Usyk 
does not throw the volume that Bacoli throws. Because Bacoli is a guy who can throw hooks from long range in volume and isn't there to be held by Usyk. In fact, Bacoli doesn't even need to clinch Usyk. So according to reports, he beat up Usyk in sparring, right? Understand when you're watching a Bacoli fight, this is Dwyer's rule on Martin Bacoli. Five of the first six rounds typically belong to Martin Bacoli. Look at the Bacoli Tony Yoka fight, folks. Yoka looks lost. I'm talking about the Olympic gold medalist. Yoka looks completely lost. He has no idea what to do in the first half of that fight. Well, understand, Bacoli is fighting American heavyweight. And right now, there are many here <laughs> in the United States who believe this guy, particularly after Deontay Wilder's loss to Zhili Zhang, that this guy is the best American heavyweight. Now, let me make a point here. You need to look at these country references and give them a grain of salt, right? Um, you and I know that Zhili Zhang actually lives in the United States. <laughs> I know he is in the rig waving a Chinese flag. Uh, he's aware of the Macau market. He's aware that if he brings a heavyweight title to China, that's going to be one of the biggest stories of any sports year. Right? But you need to look at where these guys actually live. Right? Zhili Zhang lives in the United States. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, separate the marketing out from the actuality. Also, you and I know the United States, and I know this is not advertised enough. You and I know the United States actually has a few heavyweights, right? A few heavyweights, right? Andy Ruiz is still dangerous. Wasn't that Andy Ruiz who we all saw knocking down Luis Ortiz in a fight, right? Andy is still the guy with the fastest hands in the entire heavyweight division. Now, I know Andy, of course, has Mexican heritage. I believe he was on the Mexican Olympic team. Double check me on that. But of course, here again, Andy lives in the United States, but the politics of life is such that, you know, when you think American heavyweight, we don't think of Andy Ruiz, right? Also, keep an eye on one of my favorite fighters. This is the guy who famously wrestled Terrence Crawford and lost a wrestling match, right? Private wrestling match. But this guy, bit of a geek, talked about it in interviews, right? And that's Torres, the silver medalist from the Olympics, right? He's a southpaw. Folks, he's dangerous. He gets you on your back foot from his southpaw stance with his hand speed and his volume. He's going to be a problem. Right? He sports a knockout percentage of 100%. You're not hearing about him because he doesn't have the number of fights. Because he's not based in New York or L.A. Right? So you're not hearing about him. Or Houston or Chicago. Right? One of these boxing mecca places. Philly. Right? So, Jared Anderson is being very highly touted. Right? And Jared, in interviews, seems to think... And he has sparred with Tyson Fury. He seems to think that it's a done deal, that he's going to make a lot of money. He's made a lot of money already, right, versus most fighters. But he wants championship money. You know what I'm talking about. He wants the kind of paychecks Tyson Fury has gotten, right? So he, of course, says, look, man, you know, I'm just in it for the money, right? His take's refreshing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hear him, I believe him, right? He says, look, I'm just in it for the money. Understand, they cleaned this up in an earlier generation, but that's who Ray Robinson was. Was not in love with boxing, right? You know, Jared Anderson says, look, I'm just in it for the money. Uh, just put me in the ring with the best out there and I'll prove myself. I'll earn the check. 
right? Well, folks, let me just say, uh, Jared Anderson's big win. Educate a brother. Jared Anderson's big win was against who? Who do you consider his big win against? Jerry Forrest? Charles Martin? I mean, folks, this fight, Martin Bacoli against Jared Anderson, one of two things is going to happen. Either Jared Anderson is going to prove to you that he is the next great American heavyweight. Right? And he's going to somehow do that without fighting Deontay Wilder. <laughs> without fighting Deontay Wilder. Without fighting Andy Ruiz. Right? He's going to prove to you that he's the next great American heavyweight. That the hype's been justified. And that all these stories of Martin Bacoli destroying all these men in sparring don't translate into Martin Bacoli crossing the ocean coming to Charles, excuse me, Jared Anderson's country and competing against Jared Anderson. Either Jared Anderson is the real deal or we're going to be faced with a very disconcerting realization, right? If Jared Anderson doesn't dominate, if instead something else happens, Martin Bacoli comes out and looks like he did against Tony Yoka. Right? We're going to start asking the question, wow, is Martin Bacoli one of the most avoided heavyweights in recent history? Understand, the heavyweight division right now really has led to a bunch of fighters getting avoided. You know, somehow, believe it or not, Anthony Joshua is on the verge of being a guy who is going to qualify to fight Tyson Fury if Tyson Fury beats Usyk in what will be the fight of the year, right? Their rematch later this year, right? Understand the hype for the rematch is going to be very different than the hype for the first fight. I know the first fight was for the undisputed title. But now we know, now we know that Usyk can beat Fury. Folks, that makes the rematch very different. And of course, the question is going to be, you know, who goes on? There are big fights right off stage. That Fury-Joshua fight at Wembley, wow, that's going to make a lot of people a lot of money. Right, wow, that's going to drown out every other story in UK papers on the sports page for several days. Right, so just understand, right now, Joshua, who's fighting Daniel Dubois, right, and that's going to be an offensive shootout. Let's face it, right, Dubois, not defensively blessed. Right? Joshua is a guy who needs for you to throw first before he gets into the fight. Daniel Dubois is going to throw first. Right? That's assuming we don't get the Dubois who fought Kevin Lorena. Right? Or the Dubois who fought Joe Joyce. Right? That's assuming we get the Dubois who just beat Philip Ergovic on the best night of his career. Right? Dubois is going to throw first. Joshua knows Dubois is not defensively blessed. Right? In actuality, Dubois is defensively challenged. Right? So, just understand, though, you have another guy, Joe Parker. And Parker's wondering, what does a Kiwi have to do <laughs> these days to get a shot at the heavyweight title? I've just beaten Deontay Wilder and Gili Zhang. How could... What's the logic where Joshua is getting opportunities after beating Otto Wallen and Francis Ngannou, right? You know, who here would pick in a round robin Otto Wallen and Francis Ngannou over Zhili Zhang and Deontay Wilder, 
right? So just understand, politics are ruling the day in boxing until you can't ignore them. This Martin Bacoli, Jared Anderson fight is huge, folks. Either way you slice the cake, right? If Anderson wins, suddenly you have an American who'll look like a Goliath. If Martin Bacoli wins, people like Usyk are going to have to start being asked, why is he avoiding Martin Bacoli? Right? You should know, Bacoli has sparred with Tyson Fury. I'm a total outsider. I just go by interviews that I read. Um... The Bacoli people privately believe that the only heavyweight who has a shot on beating Martin Bacoli is Tyson Fury. Right? Just understand, while boxing fans might not know the name Martin Bacoli that much, insiders do. Understand, too, and this is very important here, Bacoli has lost once. It's a tape worth watching. The guy who beat him was Michael Hunter. Right now, Hunter has also fought Alexander Usyk, and he lost to Usyk, but Hunter has a backstory about being a dad at that time for the first time and being distracted and, you know, not cutting weight the right way and stuff like that. Understand these names, particularly since father time waits for no one, and Bacoli in his 30s, Hunter in his 30s, right? Understand these names, there's an urgency you're going to have heavyweight fights where you're going to have to do some research here because some of the guys are much better than you think. I believe we're going to find that out in L.A. next month, right? Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Let's add a bonus here, right? I know... Oscar now has a new podcast where he's, you know, taking on the WBC and he uh, understands he has a superstar in William Zepeda, right? Zepeda, southpaw, front foot heavy, high volume, comes looking for you in fights, is a better boxer than you think, comes in at angles, right? Unlike Nathan Haney, who just lost his title, just understand that, um, you know, Zapata can actually regulate the tempo of a fight, right? Better fighter than advertised. Zapata, of course, wants to fight Gervonta Davis. Who doesn't, right? Davis, of course, is trying to nail down a fight with Lomachenko. Lomachenko has done the math. Understand, Shakur Stevenson was with Top Rank, who also was with Loma. And yet, curiously, that Shakur Stevenson-Loma fight was never made. Well, Loma's a little bit older, and Loma, in fairness to him, of course, Loma was fighting people like Devin Haney. It's not like Loma's fighting nobody, right? No, Loma's fighting big names, right? And, in fairness, um, Loma didn't come in above weight like Ryan Garcia did, didn't have mysterious substances in his blood like Ryan Garcia did, Right, Loma fought Haney the right way, and many of you believe Loma won that fight. That's one of those epic fights for this era, right? Well, Loma has done the math, and Loma now is saying, hey, you know what, maybe I'll wait to fight Gervonta Davis. I believe that's a bargaining ploy, but I also believe that's a math ploy. In other words, he looks out and he sees... Shakur Stevenson out there, right? He looks out, he sees Gervonta Davis. Why not let them eliminate the other? In other words, Loma doesn't want to fight both. He fights Gervonta Davis. Then, of course, Stevenson's still out there. Zapata's still out there, right? So Loma is saying, hey, look, I know who I am, <laughs> right? I know who I am. The fans know who I am. I don't need every paycheck. Not only that, it's almost like an automatic free pass for me. 
Because if Davis and Stevenson were to fight, the winner would be an even bigger name. That fight against Loma would be for an even bigger paycheck. Why take the risk if I could get a bigger paycheck two fights from now without even fighting now? Right? We get it. Well, let me just say this about Zepeda. I would bet on Zepeda in a fight against Stevenson. Right? Whatever said at the end of the day, I feel that the fans don't love Stevenson. We're just being blunt here. He's not a fan favorite. The reputation is that he's too defensive. And Stevenson seems to have some allegiance to getting belts. And I know that's the point for most boxers. Right? But at three belts, you would hope the guy would have a different attitude and start giving us exotic fights. Be more of a Chris Eubank. Right? So, while I feel Zepeda would beat Stevenson, one man's opinion, right? I believe Stevenson is the fighter who could go up in weight because of his defense and beat even bigger names, right? I would take Stevenson over Teofimo Lopez. By the way, that's another top-ranked guy who Stevenson, with a top-ranked contract, somehow was never matched against. Right? If I'm Stevenson, great defense gives you the edge in going up in weight because the other guy can't hurt what he can't hit. <coughs> Let me also say, too, we view Stevenson as a Goliath at 135. Right? He would be more of a fan favorite if he were to go up to 140, 147 and fight guys who he's better than defensively. Right? That's why here in the past I've said Stevenson should look at Dimitri Bevo and try to understand that Bevo isn't a guy who knocks out a lot of people. Bevo's really spectacular defense, back foot, combination puncher. I'll agree, Stevenson's not a combination puncher like Bevo is. Right? But Stevenson would be much more popular if we felt he was the smaller guy fighting aggressive offensive fighters, right? A Stevenson-Josh Taylor fight would be tremendous, right? Josh Taylor would be on his front foot because Josh can't help himself, right? He'd be on his front foot trying to take out Stevenson. I'm just telling you I saw Floyd Mayweather create an entire career from people who did not seem to realize that Mayweather's left hook was one of the best punches in boxing, right? Just look at the Diego Corrales left hook fast fight uh, and seem to view Mayweather as someone who they could bully, not realizing that Mayweather's real edge, even though Mayweather's a freak athlete, his real edge is mental. Mayweather would deconstruct you. Mayweather at times look at the film, is laughing during the Oscar De La Hoya fight because he figured out that De La Hoya, at the end of the day, great fighter, but a one-handed fighter, right? And, you know, I'll just say this. A lot of what Mayweather did, Stevenson could do. Stevenson doesn't have Mayweather's left hook um, he doesn't, you know, Mayweather's really a prodigy, right? But let's just say the same way Mayweather could gain weight, right? Mayweather does not weigh 154 against Oscar, right? Mayweather comes in, pounds under the limit, but Mayweather could fight an Oscar who was offensively blessed and he could take away Oscar's tools. Stevenson could do that. Just food for thought. I don't know why Stevenson's hanging around 135. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. Um, Zapata, by contrast, if he gains weight, while I think he beat Stevenson and Styles make fights at boxing, I believe he would have a problem against, let's say, Teofimo Lopez. 
right? Lopez would see a guy at some stage too much volume against a great counterpuncher is going to put you at risk because the counterpuncher is going to know they're going to be counterpunching opportunities. And make no mistake, that's who Teofimo is in the pocket, right? We predicted here that Teofimo would beat Josh Taylor. That's how he did it, right? He knew Taylor would be coming in the pocket looking for him. And Teofimo welcomed that challenge, right? There's a lot of Mayweather and Teofimo Lopez. Don't get me wrong. Lopez can't match Mayweather defensively, but he has an excellent left hook. Not a Mayweather left hook, but it's an excellent left hook. Right? And if you come to Lopez, Lopez is going to know how to counter you to death. Right? So pay close attention to William Zapata. If I'm Zapata, I do whatever I can to make the Shakur Stevenson fight happen. Because remember, you're always paid on your last fight. In other words, if Stevenson wants that extra $500,000, or that extra million dollars. I would say, okay, okay, fine. You know, take the money, let's have the fight. Because if he beats Stevenson, then he'll be the man. Then, Gervonta Davis will come to him. Right? Food for thought. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.